ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to present some of the perspective from uh, African cities. I have to caution uh, ahead of my presentation that much of the work we've done has been in Nairobi and in Kenya, and therefore a lot of what I'll talk about borrows heavily from the Kenyan experience as opposed to many African cities. And a good reason for that is that uh, perhaps if a book was to be written, How Not to Urbanize in the 21st century, I think Kenya would make a good case study of how not to urbanize um, in, in the 21st century. So uh, my topic is well-being, a perspective from African cities. And uh, the African Population and Health Research Center has been doing quite a lot of work on trying to understand the urbanization process in sub-Saharan Africa, but most importantly, the consequences of this uh, urbanization process. So I'll talk a bit about urbanization and poverty in Africa, because these two processes cannot be divorced from each other. Uh, the health challenges in urban sub-Saharan Africa, with a huge focus on Nairobi, looking at the dominance of infectious diseases uh, in the health profile, but also an emerging hypothesis of non-communicable diseases, and then trying to d dig a little bit deeper in the intra-urban intra differences in health outcomes, and just one slide on what this means for policy and practice. I think you've seen this slide perhaps in many uh, publications uh, in different forms and shapes, but I'll argue to, uh, argue to focus on the upper set of bars. And what this shows is that in the last five years, between 2005 and 2010, the, slum, the annual population growth rate in slums has been about 4.5%, and that's compared to just 1.6% in sub-Saharan Africa, and op as opposed to 3.65% in, uh, in, in, in other urban areas in general. So what this means is that slums have grown at a much faster rate than the rest of the population, but the, uh, the urban population has also grown at a faster rate than the rural population. And projections between for up to 2010 show that in actual fact, the population in slums in sub-Saharan Africa is probably going to double, and the urban population is also going to double, but then the total population, sorry, is going to increase by about 40%. So by 2010, we expect that almost more than one third or the total population in sub-Saharan Africa will actually be living in slums, and about half the population will be living in cities. And the consequence of that is the cities like Nairobi, with a very, you know, almost not comparable to Hong Kong, but getting there slowly, of central business districts, and a slum that's less than 10 kilometers from the city center or the central business district. And in some of these slum settlements, our estimates from the work we've done in some of the slums show that the population density is about 65,000 per kilometer squared. I was seeing the estimates from Chile, which is 16,000 per kilometer squared. So you can imagine maybe two and a half times of that on one kilometer squared of space. And of course, this brings different challenges in terms of, of health. Now, a critical part of this, I think it's, it, I cannot overemphasize the fact that it's not just the healthcare system that influences health, but it has a part to play in uh, health outcomes. I think the gentleman from Chile shared about 25%, which is uh, 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 critical. So the problem is that as the urban population has, grow has grown, the number of public health facilities has not kept pace with the urban growth. And we've done a survey that shows that for every one public health facility that, that serves a slum settlement, there are about 100 private health facilities of all shapes and sizes. As uh, you'll see from, these are real pictures, not photoshopped. So right down here we have a health clinic that also offers maternity services in one of the slums. This is a hospital. Hospitali is hospital in Kiswahili, the local language. And there's one up there that even has an ambulance. So there's a whole range of private health providers that have sprung up to fill a gap that is left by the absence or the near absence of public health facilities. And to make matters worse, the few public health facilities that exist open between 8 and 5 on weekdays. And that's the time when most slum residents are out looking for employment. So the result is overcrowded, but I think more overwhelmed public health facilities. And the dominant private prof profit sector, in numeric terms, has very limited support and integration in the public system, very poor regulatory framework, 
And uh, some of the f uh, studies that we've done show that um, we did a survey in three slums. Nairobi has about 80, depending on uh, different classifications. We did a survey in three slums, and we, and we enumerated more than 500 health facilities. But at the same time, the number of registered health facilities in the whole of Nairobi was less than 450. So if three slums had 500, I don't know, more, less than half of them, or maybe a quarter of them had, were registered. So very poor regulation in terms of uh, the, the private sector very, and very limited support. But this is the, uh, the system that more than 70% of the slum residents access. That's the private sector. So what are the health challenges that are, are dominant in, sub in urban sub-Saharan Africa? For the whole region in general, communicable diseases or infectious diseases account for the greatest disease burden. I think estimates in mortality put it at around 70% of the mortalities from infectious diseases. And so a similar pattern of the dominance of communicable diseases is observed in urban areas. And this can be explained by different factors, environmental factors. In urban areas specifically, uh, li limited access to clean water and sanitation services, a huge burden from indoor air pollution. Uh, among the under fives, uh, almost 25% uh, of children are dying from pneumonia. And this can be closely linked to indoor air pollution as a result of cooking practices within these small little shacks that people live in, where people cook in the same room where they sleep. Of course, overcrowding, 60,000 per square kilometer. One case of measles can easily become an outbreak because of just the close proximity of people. Food insecurity, a huge problem in terms of uh, the, the results on malnutrition in children, but also in, in women, and the consequences this has for infectious diseases. But also high risk behavior, uh, alcohol, drug use, and the association between this and sex and of course the attendant risks of HIV, for instance. But then, as I said, limited access to preventive health services. For non-communicable diseases, uh, we estimate that this, as time goes on, will outstrip communicable diseases in the next few decades. And this is uh, a result of increased uh, behavior risk factors, specifically diet, alcohol use, and tobacco use. Surprisingly or not surprisingly, especially in the slum settlements, physical inactivity is not a huge problem because people walk for miles and miles and miles looking for work. And then uh, in terms of diet, very limited dietary diversity, but also very surprising, a high use of street foods and fast foods in these slum settlements. This is very recent data that shows that the households with the severest food insecurity are the households which are most likely to consume street foods. And our assumption has been that uh, in, in these poor uh, environments, if you're to, for instance, control some of the uh, salt consumption, perhaps it's, most, it's important to focus on the household consumption patterns. But then we find that most people are consuming food outside the household. And then, of course, other environmental factors, air, water, and soil pollution. I think you've had the problem of e-waste, especially in countries like Nigeria. And then limited access to screening and other preventive services. And just to put it into perspective, in terms of risk factors, over the last 15 years, the prevalence of overweight and obesity among women of reproductive age has almost doubled, from around 13% to 25%. But this, this is at the national level. The increase is more marked in urban areas, where the rates now are almost 40% among women of reproductive age, compared to 20% in rural areas. And similar uh, results are found in, in, in Ghana. A third cause of death, death from injuries. This both intentional and unintentional, and mostly driven by road safety or lack thereof with increasing tra traffic volumes. This is a typical Nairobi street on a typical day. Limited access to emergency services. Imagine you're stuck somewhere in an ambulance in this, I mean, there's, unless you're going to fly over the, uh, the traffic, but even if you had an, uh, an, an emergency, as a result of a road traffic accident somewhere else, it's unlikely you reach anywhere in time to save your life. Of very high levels of interpersonal violence as a result of limited social cohesion, especially in these slum settlements, crime and insecurity, and limited access to law and enforcement, law enforcement and judicial services. So as a result of the uh, limited access to preventive services I mentioned earlier, uh, we find very low levels of children who are fully vaccinated, only 51%. Ha very high levels of malnutrition and stunting, HIV prevalence almost double the national, uh, the rural average, contraceptive rates that are very high, and uh, a lot of other 
uh, indicators. When you look at the top causes of death, we find that the, the, the combined uh, mortality from injuries and non-communicable diseases in a relatively young age group is almost the same as the combined death from HIV and, and age-related death. But uh, and among males in this age group, injuries and accidents contribute almost one-third of the mortality, while in females it's HIV that is mostly uh, the commonest cause of death. Other indicators, uh, if you compare the infant mortality rate per 1,000 live births, almost 96 per 1,000, compared to 60 for Nairobi as a whole, and 58 for the whole of Kenya. And down here, under five, I mean maternal mortality rate, almost 700 in the Nairobi slums, as compared to 188 for the whole of Kenya. I'll skip, uh, I'll just uh, go briefly about this. The, one of the uh, indicators where the urban, the urban is doing worse than the rural areas is teenage pregnancy. In the previous slide, the, the, the urban average is about 18% and the rural is slightly above, above 17. But if you dig, da, if you dig deeper uh, within, the urban, uh, uh, the, within the urban population, the richest urban in 1993 had a four times less probability if you're a teenager of being pregnant or having a child by age 19. And it has gone slightly up to about nine, but still compared with the urban poor, it's around 26%, almost three times, uh, three times the risk of being t a teenager and pregnant. This is my last slide about the uh, increasing risk for cardiovascular diseases, which is one of the five major communicable diseases. And what this shows, this is exclusively among the slum population. A, a diabetes prevalence of about 4%, which is not bad, but for an age group of 18 and above, if you take it at a higher age group, it's around 11%. But the most uh, disturbing statistic is that uh, out of these people who are diabetic, only 20% of them are previously diagnosed or they are aware that they are diabetic. And of those who are aware, about two-thirds are on treatment. And of those who are on treatment, that's in the last one year, only 51% are on treatment in the last two weeks. But uh, at the population level, if you start with 100 diabetics, less than one of them are actually well controlled. And the majority is because they're not aware. Those who are aware are not treated. Those who are treated are not even properly treated. And the findings on high blood pressure are not very different. So what this shows is that undetected, untreated, and uncontrolled risk factors, who, somebody who is a diabetic today will be a kidney failure in about five years' time at this rate, or will be a heart attack or a stroke in about five years' time at the rate, the rate of lack of awareness, lack of treatment, and lack of control. So the implications uh, for policy and practice. I think for urban sub-Saharan Africa, it's, it's difficult to address urban health in sub-Saharan Africa without addressing the plight of the urban poor. And our research has shown that if you ask them what are your most important needs, employment is high on the list. So it's not enough to say we shall provide health services. Employment is about the, um, for 40% of the respondents, it's the most important uh, uh, need. A triple burden of disease is evident, as we showed, infectious disease, communicable and injuries, and we think that health and other social indicators for the urban poor will increasingly drive national indicators. And slum settlements, positively, are highly resourced. They are entrepreneurs, they are civil societies, they are humanitarians, and policies and programs that aim to improve health and well-being in urban sub-Saharan Africa need to harness all these resources. I thank you.